Hey guys, this is Vinyl Man Jeb. And Owen Radford. You're tuned in to Rob Lane's Straight to Video Podcast. Thank you, Rob, for letting us have a little bit of an ad space here. We are from RoboJack Records, and we're here to talk to you about our artists. We have artists such as Desolation Sound. Jeb. Jeremy Peck. Jim Terrell. Owen Radford. And the Sane Riot. And we are here just to say, hey, we're a new label. We're doing some stuff. Straight to Video Podcast has a little website section on our website. And we just love that Rob lets us sponsor here. We do have merch now. We can get hats, shirts. We're working on doing CDs as well. So check out RoboJackRecords.com and plug into Straight to Video Podcast here with Rob Lane. Take it away, Rob. to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What is up? You all doing okay? I certainly hope so, and thank you for checking out my podcast, Straight to Video. So after the chat in the last episode with Tim Rose, who played Admiral Akbar in the Star Wars movie Return of the Jedi, which I recommend you check out, I'm going to be continuing that Star Wars theme in today's episode. Not planned, simply by chance, but this was a fun one. Today I'm speaking to David Menken who is a film, television and voice actor who in the past has worked on programs such as the rebooted Thunderbirds from 2015 to Thomas and Friends, that's Thomas the Tank Engine to a lot of us. He also starred alongside Tom Hanks in the film Hologram for the King and also appeared in Zero Dark Thirty but David has become quite the personality in the world of video games and most recently landed the huge role of doing the voice for Luke Skywalker in the brand new Lego video game The Skywalker Saga which is out now. Video games these days are pretty much as big as movies themselves so this is a really big deal for David and the Star Wars fandom so to chat to him about this and his journey which led him here was a real treat. Before we dive in please spend a minute or two to visit my friends over at Dead Skull Coffee and if you order some of their amazing ground or full bean rock and roll coffee through their website deadskullcoffee.co.uk and add the discount code STV on checkout you will receive 15% off your order. Lots happening in the Dead School Coffee Camp right now, so make sure to get on board. All right, if you want to reach out to David and keep up to date with everything he's doing, you can find him on Instagram and Twitter, simply at David Menken. But right now, please enjoy my straight-to-video chat with film, television and voice actor, the wonderful David Menken. Thanks for having me on. You're usually speaking to uh, musicians, I see. It's pretty varied. Anyone kind of, if I can push it down any 80s pop culture route, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody. (laughs) Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, it's a pleasure to be on. I'd love to learn a little about your early journey growing up, because I think it's quite unique in how it put you on the path to where you're on today. Yeah. Obviously, the listeners can hear a strong American accent, but you grew up in Norway before moving to Africa, I believe, and then eventually to the UK in 1987. That's right. How did the American accent develop? Is that from being around your dad who's from New Jersey or is it just watching too many films as a kid? I think it's a bit of both. My parents made sure that when I was very young, all of my bedtime stories were in English. So they read uh, Winnie the Pooh and and things like that to me, which was uh, pretty amazing. And so my dad made sure that English was a part of my vernacular from a very young age. But I didn't really speak it as my main language until we moved to the UK. But then I went to an American school. So I went to one of those international schools. And that's where, you know, you had to change from tidy whitey underwear to boxer shorts. And you had to go from whatever accent you had to a generic American accent. And then you were accepted as part of the, you know, the group. But this was in the UK. Mm -hmm. Wow. I didn't realize that was a thing. There's loads of international schools. Wow. Yeah, they're all over the place. Yeah, you know, Maggie Thatcher kind of screwed up the English school system uh, back in the 80s. So all the companies that would come over would send us to um, to international schools. Right. So was all these kids from these in these international schools, their parents were from America working in the UK? Is that kind of how it was? Yeah. So 60% American and then the rest from all over the place. So a lot of people from IBM, a lot of people from the aerospace industries and, and stuff like that. And there were separate schools for 
Ministry of Defense or DOD, as they call it, Department of Defense schools. So military brats kind of thing. And they would be at different schools, but we would play them in sports and stuff like that. Do you have fond memories of that? Is that something you're glad you experienced? I mean, yeah, it has turned me into the person that I am. I have a classification. It's called a TCK, a third culture kid. So it means pretty much that I can fit in pretty much anywhere, sort of uh, an ambassador's reception or the wrong side of the tracks. But at the same time, I don't really feel like I like I fully belong anywhere. So I'm good at making friends. But with that also comes this sort of thing that all of my old classmates talk about, which is the, the kind of thing where you're always worried that the people that you become friends with or that you fall in love with are going to leave you because usually people would be expats. So they'd leave after about three years. So thanks to Facebook and stuff like that, I've now reconnected with everybody from my childhood. But I do think that, yeah, it's made me who I am. My mom insisted that I go and take Norwegian classes while I was there. So I'm able to work as both. All my friends growing up were, most of them were Swedish. So I speak Swedish as well. Very cool. I'm just like a international cosmopolitan cocktail. And like you say, your mom's from Norway. How did she and your dad meet? Do you know? My mom was working in New Jersey and they met there. He then followed her back to Norway and then he started working in the oil industry, which meant then that we then started traveling again. So yeah, I'm so lucky that I got to experience so many different cultures growing up. Who gets to say that? Exactly. When did you first get to experience the USA? When I was very young, we visited my dad's family and, and things like that. I think I was four years old. And then, you know, we traveled to, to the States a little bit. But my main sort of American immersion was when I was at NYU. So I went to New York University after I graduated high school. Was you a fan of like American culture as a kid? The films and all that kind of stuff. And when you finally got there, like, holy crap, <laughs> it's amazing. Being a child of the 80s and 90s, anybody was. Film, music, everything came from the States fashion. So I didn't have to do very much. The only thing that I felt when I arrived at university was the sort of sitcoms that all of my classmates had grown up with that I hadn't necessarily been uh, experienced. What did you go over there with Coronation Street and Neighbours? <laughs> neighbors and EastEnders and Morecambe and Wise and, and all that kind of stuff, which, you know, just weird. And uh, Jim will fix it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ugh. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> they were like, what the hell is this stuff? So I got all of my friends hooked on English tea, toffee crisp bars, and real Kit Kats, not the American ones. Did you find that all your American friends knew about the young ones? That seemed to be something my family know about, my cousins. Like, I love the young ones. Do you know? Yeah, I think so. I guess the UK was sort of known like anarchy. That was the kind of thing that people sort of fell in love with from the outside. I don't know if it was like shown late night on MTV or something like that. Must have been something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, syndicated. I wonder if the guys ever got money for it. Who knows? What kind of things were you into like as a kid? I mean, did you see a career in film, TV or anything like that? Because um, I think music was big for you at some point as well, right? Yeah. So I was a singer when I was a kid. I was a boy soprano. And then when I arrived in the UK, I got involved in musical theater. Anything like that in your family? Well, this is the thing. So my grandfather on my mother's side was sort of like an amateur opera singer. But I found out that a cousin of my dad's was in the original touring company of Hair and then went on Broadway with the show. So clearly there's something on both sides. But yeah, I sort of fell in love with singing and then with acting because of it, because I kept on doing musicals and then they would be like, well, why don't you try auditioning for the plays as well? And that's sort of what, what seeded it for me. But music, I mean, I had a very, very varied I mean, I loved hard rock. Can't throw some names at me if you grew up in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, Def Leppard, yes. Motley Crue, you know, Hysteria. I mean, uh, come on. And then at very, very much at the end, we, of course, got the Seattle sound that came out. But for the most part, I was sort of very, very much into sort of everything. I was learning about what sound can do and what music can do to people. And because of that, I sort of just would dip in everywhere. And, uh, you know, I would sing with the jazz band. I would sing with the regular choir. I would join bands and stuff like that when they'd have me because I was, a little, you know, a little weirdo. How was you as a rock and roll front man? Well, I mean, I was awkward as hell, but I could hit the notes. So that was, <laughs> that was good. And then learned a little bit about stagecraft when I went to New York. Was that to study musical theater in New York? Yeah, it was. It was. I did a summer course at New York University and absolutely fell in love with it. And they took it so seriously. And, you know, musical theater in the States is an art form. No one really thinks that MT is, is something that you should be ashamed of loving. While in the UK, 
that's not really the case. It's seen as slightly, you know, twinkle toes and that kind of stuff. And when I got to New York, I realized how much they thought of it as art. And I really immersed myself in it and then came back to the UK halfway through because of a uh, family money situation. It's very expensive to go to college in the States. <laughs> was you out there on your own then? Or did you still have some of the family in New Jersey? Out there on my own, was taken care of by an aunt who would, you know, take me to dinner and let me stay with her uh, every so often, which was amazing. But then when I came back to the UK, I finished my education and I just didn't feel that I fit into the musical theater sphere. So I started doing like the weird the weird shows, the Sondheims and that kind of stuff. Yeah, because you did some West End kind of stuff, right? I did, yeah. I mean, I you know, I did the Rat Pack Live from Las Vegas, but, uh, you know, that kind of killed my love of musical theater. So, <laughs> but then while I was training, I got a chance to work for a Norwegian TV station and that was to be their continuity announcer. So I would write my own scripts. I had to learn microphone technique. I had to learn how to speak to an audience, keep them engaged and make sure that we kept our viewers from the end of one show into another and stuff like that. Great training. And then from that, I got a voiceover agent and started working, you know, doing commercials and promos and things like that. But then I found out that I could get to do animation. So that was the big thing for me. And my first job in animation was as Scoop and Bob the Builder for the States. It was recorded here and that just opened up this new door for me. And within a few years, I played my first lead in a video game. I was in Battlefield Bad Company. I was a guy called Preston Marlowe, who you play in the game. And it's become a cult game. And I just absolutely fell in love with it. So while I was in love, I'd also fallen in love from around 2013, screen acting. So film and TV. I also fell in love with voice acting. And I'd always been really fascinated about what people do with their voices in order to create characters and stuff like that. You know, watching Transformers when I was a kid. But getting to do it changed my life. Absolutely. Are modern video games something you're a fan of or was that a whole new world? Well, there's this. My mom wouldn't let me play video games. So I didn't have a console. So I'd visit my friend Gustav's house. We would play everything from like Echo the Dolphin to Ants. And of course, the usual sort of Mario and all that kind of stuff. You know, he had a Sega Genesis and then he got a PlayStation. And I loved it, but I just was never great at it. So when I started playing these games and the games became popular, I had to learn about them. And so then I started watching playthroughs and walkthroughs on YouTube. And then during lockdown, I managed to score a PlayStation 5. And now I'm a gamer. I'm a gamer. Sure. I'm going to call myself a gamer. <laughs> but yeah, I absolutely love it. I'm terrible. Yeah. Absolutely terrible. You should do your own YouTube channel of someone who's so ingrained in it, but you're the one playing it and making a mess of it. People keep on inviting me to their Twitch hangouts to play with them. And I'm like, I'm not going to get through the first level. You're just going to get frustrated with me. My nephews, they hate playing with me because they, they think I'm just awful. How do they feel about you being the part of the game, though? Are they impressed by that? I mean, they act as if it's just boring. Oh, yeah, come on, stop showing off and stuff like that. But then you can hear them. Oh, yeah, my, my uncle's here. He's, he's the... Is the yeah, he's the voice on that. It's nice. Like you say, you worked on some iconic kids TV shows such as Bob the Builder and I think you've done some stuff on Thomas the Tank Engine. Is it still called Thomas the Tank Engine or is it Thomas and Friends? It's called Thomas and Friends, yes. And it's just changed format again, so we're not involved anymore. But that was a really huge thing for me because I learned very quickly that Thomas and Friends has a very, very specific fan base. People learn about the show when they're very young and then they remain fans until they're in their 20s, 30s and beyond. And I was told very quickly that that was very special. And that's because the old Thomas the Tank Engine show was a way for people on the autism spectrum and people who had a difficulty learning about mimicry and how to connect your feelings to how you express them, they would use Thomas and Friends. Wow, I never knew that. Because the trains, whenever they were sad, you could hear that they were sad, but they also had the sad expression on for a very long time. And it helped a generation of these kids who weren't getting the help from their schools and, and so on. It helped them learn how to fit in in a way. And therefore... You know, I still have people on Twitter who get in touch with me and it's an honor to be part of 
that world. It really is. One thing to be part of something that's just so well loved and iconic in pop culture, but also down a different Absolutely. path as well. That's very rewarding. Yeah. On that note, also, you know, getting to be part of Thunderbirds. I did the new version, Thunderbirds Are Go, which was animated on real backgrounds and models. They call them maxi miniatures, I think. So Tracy Island was the size of like a room. It was huge, but then they put CGI on top of that. And my agent called me up and she's like, I've got you a casting for something. And for the first time ever, I'm just going to say, don't fuck this up. <laughs> and I went in there with, and I was like, oh, wow, because the new generation of Thunderbirds fans came in the 90s and I really wasn't that aware of the show. I'd seen it because it was such a big part of British culture. I think they reran it in like the 80s sometime, but that might have been just as you came over. Exactly. So they brought it back, but I sort of missed it each time. And then when I was part of it, I understood how important it was. Yeah, I consider myself very lucky to be part of that family. You've done all that, but you're also doing on-screen stuff as well. You was in Zero Dark Thirty, I believe. How was that experience? That was pretty amazing. I went in and I had to audition with material from All the King's Men. And they wouldn't tell me what I was there to audition for. And then a schedule conflict came up because I was told I was going to be an interrogator. That's all I heard. And then we had a schedule conflict. And Catherine Bigelow looked at my tape again. And she went, do you know what? Let's write something for him. We think there's a person that we've met who would fit him very, very well. And I was then written in as David. <laughs> and I played an audio analyst who... He would listen to all of the tapes that Bin Laden would send out, and he would listen to everything in the background to see if he could figure out where he was. That was his job. So there was only, only certain scenes that I was in, but I was given all of this background material on him. And then Mark Bull would write my stuff the day before I shot. I would get my script under the door at around 10 p.m., 7 to 10 p.m., and then I'd have to learn it overnight in order to shoot it the next day. How was you feeling about this because obviously everything's like super exciting you're doing all the kids stuff the voiceover stuff and now these big budget hollywood movies was you happy just to well bouncing from one thing to the other or did you think oh no i'm just going to focus on this or where was your head at a teacher once told me that i had to choose that i couldn't be greedy in this industry i would have to do one thing or another and i said i want to do everything and i was told that that's not possible and i refused <laughs> <laughs> You're quite stubborn when it comes that to advice. stuff like that. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that everything informs everything else in my work. And especially when it comes to games and animation now, it is becoming more and more realistic. I'm doing a lot more adult animation, video games that are clearly for an 18 plus audience where they want realism. They want it to feel like a movie. And there's a reason why they ask for actors. They want voice actors. They don't want voiceover artists. And I'm so lucky. I mean, I, I work my ass off, but I am so lucky because I get to do everything. I was on TV in the UK this Friday in a show called The Other One, which is on BBC. And I'm going to be on a show on Netflix coming up called The Sandman and another show called The Power, which is on Amazon. So I get to do everything. I get to ruin all of my friends' viewing experiences on a regular basis. <laughs> when you was on Zero Dark Thirty, you didn't by any chance cross paths with Mark Duplass by any chance, did you? I did not. No? I did not. I'm a not. big fan of all his work. What him and his brother do is fantastic. They are, they're amazing. Absolutely amazing. No, I only got to work with Jennifer E. Lee and uh, Jessica Chastain. And a few other people who were brought over to, we filmed in India for Pakistan. But yeah, it was, it was awesome. I've gotten to work with sort of all the big, big movie stars, which is just crazy to me. Some guy called Tom Hanks. <laughs> just a guy called Tom Hanks. How did you get involved in that film? Was that just through an agent putting you up for an audition? Or? Yeah, I was asked to audition for it. And the process took three months and I almost lost my mind. I had to practice the art of letting go on many an occasion because I was like, there's no way I have this. They're filming already. They've got to be done. And then my agent would be like, well, yeah, they're just checking dates again. And then finally, I was just told, yep, you're going out to Morocco and to Berlin. Uh, it's going to be over three months. 
And then we were just out in the desert. There was nothing to do. So therefore, every night, it was pretty much dinner with Tom or breakfast with Tom. <laughs> wow. And you just can't believe it. And, you know, he is such a raconteur. He has such amazing stories. So every day, we would just shoot the shit with him. And he is one of the most kindest, most generous people I've ever met. Well, his entire team were amazing. So I was super, super lucky to be working with him. It also meant that I got to work with Tom Tickfer, the man behind Run Lola Run, one of the directors for Cloud Atlas. That's where he and Tom Hanks met. So they did Hologram for the King together. And then Tom Tickfer is one of the directors on The New Matrix. You know, got to work with Meryl Streep and Hugh Grant. And that's the thing. What I notice is that people who are at the top of their game, they are usually lovely people as well as being really talented. There's a reason why they're up there and staying up there. Because, I mean, I have met a lot of assholes in this industry. <laughs> you don't have to name them. It's fine. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. I don't want to be libeled, but they are, they're out there and they're insecure and you learn very, very quickly. But what I learned from the people who were the best was work ethic, how to make people feel special, how to conserve energy, all those things that are really, really important to learn in any business. Making someone feel special is an amazing gift and talent to have, and it's priceless. People take that and tell everybody and never forget it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He was the subject of a podcast called The Dead Eyes Podcast, which was an actor who found out he was hired, then fired from Band of Brothers back in the day because he had dead eyes, according to Tom Hanks. So this entire podcast season was about him trying to have a meeting with Tom Hanks. And finally, because Tom's son heard about it, then was in, interviewed by them, and they brought Tom on. I mean, spoiler alert, but it is an amazing podcast series. That sounds fantastic. So after they finish listening to yours, I think your listeners should definitely listen to the Dead Eyes podcast. I'm on that one. That sounds really, really cool. I believe it was as far back as 2018 that wheels were set in motion for you landing the role as Luke Skywalker in the new Lego video game, The Skywalker Saga. What can you tell me about that? How you heard about that role? How you got it? Because I can't imagine the secrecy behind it all. It had a code name. The only thing is that a friend of mine said, so are you being seen for this? And I was like, what? <laughs> what am I not being seen for? And he was like, I was like, what? <laughs> so I did something that I don't ever do. I called up my agent and I said, I know who's doing it. I know who's casting it. They know me. Please tell them that I can do this. Specifically the Luke Skywalker role or just I want a part of yep. it? Yeah, it was Luke and it was another character. And I was like, I really feel that I can do a good job at these. I am more than happy to do a self-tape, to send them stuff or whatever. And she went, all right, I'll let them know. And they got back to her and they said, fine. All right, tell them to come in and show off. And I have never prepared for anything as much as I prepared for this. <laughs> How do you prepare for that, though? Do you just go and watch the Star Wars <laughs> movies? Or? I used, I had my phone with all of the iconic lines. I sat there and I recorded all of them. And I was like, I thought that they wanted a full impersonation. And I'm not an impersonator. I'm an actor. So therefore, they were like, no, because there are certain lines that are not in the films. And also, this is a game that has to be played by kids first and foremost. So therefore, we can't have his hand get chopped off and then him screaming. And we don't want to traumatize a child. So you have to find the middle ground between what Luke is and what the people who are playing this game need. So I went in with that and I went, sure, all right. And I worked my ass off. There was a lot of sweat. And then a couple of weeks later, I got an email that I had been approved by LucasArts. Have you still got that email framed? <laughs> Printed out and framed? <laughs> no, there's, there's a tweet that I'm getting framed. There was a tweet, which I will tell you about in a little bit. And then I started working. And while all this was happening, I went to promote a film that I was in in San Francisco. So I went down to the Lucas campus that's right by the Golden Gate Bridge because I knew that there was a Yoda fountain there. I was like, I'm going to go and take a photo with the Yoda fountain. And people were so rude. There was this security guard there and he was just trying to make sure that people weren't getting in the way of people who actually had to go in and do work okay. and stuff. I went up to him and I went, first of all, I'm so sorry. People just don't understand. And I was like, is it okay if I take a photo? I'll make sure to get out of the way if anybody comes. And he went, do you know what's okay? Being nice. And he went, 
in you go. And he let me into the reception where full-size Darth Vader, full-size R2-D2, just mind-blowing. And there I am taking photos and wanting to like say to the receptionist, I belong. I'm part of the team. I was, you know, I was NDA'd into the ground. So I did that. And then during lockdown, they got in touch and they wanted some pickups for some things. They extended the deadline for the game because people were working way too hard. So it was uh, delayed by just over a year, I think. And then the roller coaster started just over a month ago. And it's been really lovely. We've I've been part of uh, raising a lot of money for uh, Ukraine, where we recreated our roles from certain games that we've played in. The actors came in and recreated it, and we raised almost 90,000 pounds. So the fact that I selfishly get to be part of something like this, and then I get to do something good because of it, is amazing. Superb. So what was the tweet? <laughs> so... I was on another podcast and they were saying to me that, you know, just so you know, you do realize that you're like one of a few Lukes, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I know that. And they went, Mark Hamill's usually really, really nice about it. He is very open to Luke being interpreted differently. And they proved that because they put that in the tweet to promote the podcast and he responded. So there is a welcome David Menken from Mark Hamill. And all I could do was sit and sweat for 15 minutes. I was just, huh, okay, what do I do? Do I, do I write everything I want to write to him and then take it as a screenshot and then put it into my tweet? And of course, all I wrote was thank you because he doesn't have time for that. But he was so generous to do that because, you know, a lot of people are very proprietary about Star Wars, very proprietary about when it comes to how Luke is supposed to sound. And I got to say, I'm, I've been very lucky. I've been, I've had super, super positive feedback, but I was warned that there could be some backlash. It's Star Wars. Get ready. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, there's only been like a couple of tweets where they, you know, they insist on tagging you in their review where they're like, well, but for the most part, it has just been, it's been like a warm embrace from the fandom. And, oh man, we're so lucky to be doing this. My colleagues and I, it's been an amazing, amazing experience. And I pinch myself on the regular. Probably a daft question, but how much of a Star Wars fan was you growing up? Well, my dad took me to Empire Strikes Back. The two sort of first films that I got to see were E.T. and Empire Strikes Back. It's a good starting block, that is. Yeah. <laughs> so they are, in a sense, a direct umbilical to my childhood. So I went to see E.T. with the orchestra at the Hollywood Bowl, and all I did was cry. And just before I got the part, my friend took me to something called Secret Cinema here in the UK. It's sort of an immersive experience before you then go and watch the movie. So what they did was A New Hope as the immersive experience, and then you went through and watched Empire Strikes Back. I was one of the people that was told to dress up as a Jedi, so I dressed up, I had a bathrobe, like a ridiculous Jedi, and then, you know, it was News International's print works out in East London. So we turn up, we're being told that we have to stop off in Tatooine to deliver a secret message, and we're like, okay, sure. We land, and the doors open, and it's an elevator, by the way, but it was a spaceship. And we are on Tatooine. So sand, it made a full, full-on replica. So we step off. So I'm, my jaw is agape at this point. Then around the corner comes R2-D2, who starts to bleep, bleep, bleep at me. And I start crying so hysterically that my friends had to take me away. So yeah, I think I'm a Star Wars <laughs> yeah, a fan. Bit of fan. So how extra tough was that? For you then, while you're doing all this, you're getting confirmation of the part, you're starting to do the lines, you're so heavily involved, and then like stuff like Rise of Skywalker's coming out, all the other Star Wars stuff like The Mandalorian, everyone's losing their minds, and you can't say a thing that you're going to be doing your thing. Could not say a thing. <laughs> Just couldn't do anything. Like, what are they going to do with Star Wars next? There's nothing left to do, and you're like... Mm -hmm. <laughs> But what was what was great was, of course, that new trailers would come out and at least I'd, I'd have confirmation that I hadn't been fired. But like, oh, thank God. OK, it's still me. Jesus. OK. But then when the game came out, because it had been so top secret, you didn't know who was playing who. Uh, so AJ Locasio, he plays Han Solo. He was like, who's Luke? And finally, I was able to be like, oh, it's me. And it's been, yeah, it's been 
amazing. That's all I can say. Excellent. And like you say, you got the go ahead and the approval from Mark Hamill himself. But not only that, he's a bit of a legend in the voiceover world himself doing the Joker. And that's the thing. He did Chucky in the Child's Play remake more recently. Did they ever approach him to reprise the role? Because he'd be like, I can nail this. Probably. Yeah. Or would I wouldn't like, be surprised. His voice is older now or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the thing. A guy called Nathan Osgood played the older Luke in the game because if I was going in and doing both young and old Luke I would have had to do stuff to my voice to sort of rough it up like I have today because I've been screaming on another job and they went do you know what don't worry about it we've got a great guy and Nathan is amazing so I have no idea if they approached him I'm guessing all the originals were approached and the thing is though that they're expensive and they're also busy they are booked and blessed, as the drag queens would say. <laughs> so yeah, I was very lucky that they weren't available. How different was it doing this particular thing, the Star Wars stuff? Because not only you're a fan, let's put that to one side, but how is it compared to other voiceover work where I'm guessing you supply the lines and the animation is kind of set to that. But I guess with this one, you had a pretty good idea of how it was going to look at the end because you're recreating some classic scenes. Yes, exactly. And then, so what they would have to do was tell me when... when when they would change things. So for example, in this game, when the Luke, I'm your father. Yeah. Spoiler. Exactly. Spoiler here. 40 something years. You know, that scene, how did R2-D2 reconnect with them? So they fixed it. So R2-D2, he actually, he gets in the way of Darth trying to grab Luke. They both fall together. Right. They actually fix something in the canon. But the difference compared to other jobs is that first of all, you don't have you don't have a sound engineer losing his shit in the other room because you get to say these iconic lines. The only people that you can share this joy with are the people that are in the room with you. So that was that was nice. But usually we go in, sometimes, it's not very often, sometimes we get to do an ensemble record so we get to work with the people that we in the game with or in the, in the animated series or films with. But that's why they hire such great directors. And they are the ones who make sure that everyone sounds like they're working with each other. And then sometimes you get to hear if somebody went in before you and recorded their lines, you can actually hear their lines. So that's nice. But for the most part, I create the performance. But the thing is, with this sort of the performance created my interpretation. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was different. That is for sure. Now you're on this Star Wars train. Are you excited? Will you be heading out to any conventions or anything like that to interact with fans? Is there any opportunities for that, do you think? Or are you just busy with other stuff? Well, I've joined an agency called Cool Waters Productions and they have some of the biggest stars from Star Wars and Star Trek and other films and games and animated series. And they bring them to conventions. So I just recently joined them. But it takes about like six months to set all that stuff up. So yeah, I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm doing a, a signing for a convention type thing with my colleagues from another game called Valorant in June. And I think that there's more stuff coming. The last time I did anything like that was for Thunderbirds. We got to go to Comic-Con. We got to go to the mothership. Who do you want to be sat next to? Who's signing autographs next to you? Ooh. Who's on the wish list? Ooh, man. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. I don't discriminate. So I'm a huge Star Trek fan as well. So anybody from Next Generation or Voyager, maybe. Anybody involved in the Star Wars canon or any of sort of my the voiceover gods if i got to meet bob bergen at some point i think i'd lose my shit the voice of pretty much every single old classic cartoons he took over after mel blanc and has been the voice of pretty much all of them yeah there are a lot of heroes out there and supposedly most of them are really really lovely you mentioned them earlier so i gotta ask any plans to catch the def leppard motley crew stadium tour in america <laughs> seriously seriously <laughs> it's so tempting it's so tempting. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like it's going to happen. No one thought it would, but I think it might. I know. And because the thing is, what I want to do is go there, get as far to the front as possible, and then turn around and look at what kind of people are in the audience. I don't know if it'd be very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> are you a Poison fan as well? Of course. Oh, yes. my man. We could have done an old podcast about that. <laughs> oh, man. It's just, oh, yeah. I mean... Any of those bands, if they had a slow song, that's when you got to do a slow dance with somebody. You got to go close. So, yeah. You're a big power ballad fan then. Absolutely. That reason. <laughs> Fucking lutely. And also, they're fun to sing. I'll put you on the spot, which is the greatest hair metal power ballad of all time. You can have as long as you want to think about it. Make a wise choice. <laughs> do you know what? Because I sort of grew up during it. Winds of Change, I think, is one of the absolute best. You couldn't escape that song. What about yours? Um, I don't know. Let me think. It might have to be a Skid Row one. 
I Remember You or Warrant. I Remember You? Oh, my God. Yes. Any Warrant ballad is a classic. Yeah, we'll have to do a, a part two and we'll just talk about hard rock bands. <laughs> I'm there. David, it's been a pleasure. It's been so nice talking to you. Congratulations and hold on tight for what's coming next now this Star Wars game's out there. So much fun. Thank you. All right, man. We enjoy the rest of your evening. Really lovely talking to you. All righty. Take it easy, man. All the rest. Bye-bye. Massive thank you to David Menken for such great stories and memories here on the Straight to Video podcast. I had a lot of fun chatting with him and I'm genuinely excited to see where his journey takes him next. As mentioned, if you too would like to keep up to date with David, then he's on Twitter and Instagram at David Menken and be sure to let him know you heard his chat right here on this podcast. 200 episodes are just around the corner and will be upon us before we know it, so be sure to like, follow and subscribe wherever you listen to shows, or you can find them all at stvpod.com, along with some straight-to-video music, videos and merchandise. So that is all for today's show. I hope you enjoyed my chat with David Menkin, and I look forward to sharing a brand new episode with you all again very soon. Music